I'm Jackie Hurley and you're listening to In Conversation With. Do this. Honestly. Like, yeah. I was actually I think, like, this is embarrassing. I like, think, you know, like, looking back at the first email was 2018, like maybe May or oh, June. Um, and it's taken this long, but look, that's the way I'm really sorry. Cash, do you know what? It's just times it was like, yeah, I can do that. And then we, I couldn't do it, then you can do it and whatever. And I was just like, what? Like, so I'm like, actually normally I, not that hard to I, pin I, down. Like, like, I was reading yeah. your interview with the RT guides and you were saying that like, you sit down with your husband and you plan. Yeah. But then you end up just throwing everything oh, I know. up in the air and just like, seeing what lands and nuts. sometimes so, things land at the same time. Yeah, so, so sorry about that. It's not a problem. Yeah, we're recording anyway, so nice. God, can't fire away. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of In Conversation with I'm Gavin Kelly, back with Colin McDonald. How are you going? And we're back in RTE, Colin. It's been a while, it's been a while. I we still don't work for RTE. No, no, unfortunately not. Maybe after this, who knows. Uh, yeah, no, it's been a while since we were in RTE. I can't actually remember the last one we did. It was Key Walsh. Was it Key Walsh? It could have been, yeah. yeah. Um, but we're glad to be back. Absolutely. It's my, one of my favourite places to yeah. come. Uh, today we're joined by sports broadcaster Jackie Hurley. Hi guys, thanks, thanks for having for, me. Thanks for having me coming on Jackie it was a, a while in the making yeah but we're, we're here now yeah look I'm really sorry I this is actually I've genuinely wanted to do this podcast for ages it is just trying to get a there time in go. the diary That's, so I'm go. glad that uh, we finally got it review yeah. already um yeah so let's dive straight into it Jackie and the first thing when I was doing research that I actually didn't know about you prior so you spent quite a bit of your early life in Australia yeah mum and dad was, what was the reason behind moving down under they basically in the last recession like loads of families are well used to this now lots of people are moving away but during the last recession in the 80s my mom and dad my dad's an electrician my mom's a nurse they were just offered a better life over there mm. and like very familiar story to a lot of people they just thought let's have a go went away the plan was to go for like one to three years and then they end up staying for seven they loved it and mm. really the only reason we came home is my mom's parents were kind of getting to that stage where last few years she was just she didn't want to be coming home for a funeral so she yeah. just thought let's go home let the kids explore their Irishness and we did and like I'm delighted we came home but it was an amazing experience to get the lifestyle and the upbringing in Australia Becoming as well. quite a prolific netball player yep. uh, along the way. Yeah well we were doing that you know because I started playing basketball when I came back to Ireland but myself and my sister were playing uh, netball on like Canberra teams and that kind of thing down in Australia so that's where it started because like they are a nation that love sport. Like yeah, they really just is. commit to sport like nothing I've ever seen. Anything you want, the facilities are there. It's unbelievable. Like it's actually unrivaled, genuinely. Like it's it's amazing. But I'd say it's fair to say that you probably would have still had the same passion for sport had you spent Definitely. your early childhood. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And like I think that's ingrained in your house. Like my mom and dad were into sport. My brother and sister were into sport. So like it can definitely be taught but I think with a lot of people it actually is the nature of it that you're just around the house it's your natural conversation we were going to matches at the weekends whether that was in Australia or Ireland I think that would have been fostered in our house anyway uh, I want to mention now because you mentioned basketball you're obviously you're are you still playing now at this I am back still playing, playing yeah. senior, took a senior break yeah. yeah took a break to have some kids but uh, back at it back now, at yeah. it again and are you a big follower of the NBA I don't follow it as much as I used to. Okay. Um, the times of it tend to kind of clash with yeah, life. Of course, yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. But when I was younger, I used to watch it all the time because, like, you've no responsibility. You don't really care what time of the night you're up watching it. But now, actually, it probably doesn't suit my lifestyle as much. But mm. I love watching it. And anytime I go to America, I always go to a game. You Would know? you have had many favorite players or favorite teams growing up? Well, when I was a kid, I was a huge Bulls fan. Like, and because yeah, around that time, like that's like the Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan yeah. era, Bulls Tony era, Kukoc, yeah. when they are just killing it, like in the nineties. So I grew up loving that. And then. I suppose later in life, like after Phil Jackson moved on and he went to the Lakers, they sort of just became like this new franchise and everything that they did then with Shaq and Kobe and all was deadly to watch. But my formative years were probably spent wearing oversized Bulls jerseys, thinking I was the shit and yeah. I clearly was not looking back at pictures. Oh yeah, like I think, I think I'm the same. Like I play basketball every Tuesday now just like for fun with a few of my mates and I'll bring out like I have my Giannis Antetokounmpo jersey oh, yeah. or my Russell Westbrook jersey because they're my two favorite players. Yeah. and you just go around pretending that you're them. Oh for, yeah, like, a few yeah. Minutes There's nothing wrong with that though. This oh, is nice to all. dream, yeah, you yeah. know. He's in your age, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that Giannis is going to win the title now this season. We'll see how how the books go. Um, uh, uh, Jackie yeah. was so of course sport was obviously a big interest when you're young, but with media, you know, journalism. 
presenting was that a thing that you had to grow into it, or it, pro- it was something I was always interested in like I was always fascinated about the news and that like my mum and dad used to say when I was a kid I used to walk around with the TV set up saying you know telling them what match was on or whatever so I was probably always into it but I don't know if I saw it as a career like mm-hmm. until probably even I'd say when I was in college like when I was in school it was something that I spoke to my career guidance teachers about and like I had a nun as a career guidance teacher to who was it. trying to genuinely yeah. talk. I mean, I mean, amazing woman, lovely lady, but just could not see it. Like, basically said, there's no way you're going to get a job in that. Like, mm-hmm. would you not be a teacher or a nurse or whatever, you know? And I understand her reasons, but it probably was, it took me a while to kind of break it down to realize that this actually could have been a genuine job opportunity. And you, you kind of need to walk the process as well and see what life is going to look like as yeah. well to see whether you actually can get a job. Mm. And then just your time in college. So you did media and communications? Yeah. Mary Immaculate? Yeah. Um, similar to our course, we did communications. Um, how did you find it? I loved it. The reason I chose that one actually is because there was a third year off campus. Right. And the big thing to me was... I suppose in this industry, trying to get the experience is the hardest part. And I find even talking to students these days, you know, a lot of places don't do work experience programs. So it's really hard to get in. So I had seen that there was a co-op year where you could either work or study. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to take a year abroad working because by the time I do that, I'll be able to come back and I'll have like real world experience. So um, I went to America, did my internship over there. And by the time I came back when I was in fourth year, I was I kind of had the jump on a lot of my peers because I had actually worked in a newsroom for a year. I had done everything from like running tapes to auto cue to presenting. Like so it actually that's probably the reason why I have the job I do now, because that kind of the background in getting the practical work was the big thing. So I loved college for that reason, you know, and I read that you were um, you did uh, your work experience in, in Mississippi. What were some of the uh, biggest differences in kind of broadcasting operations or day-to-day operations between your work in America and now your work here in Ireland? Or well, it's actually, it's amazing. It's quite similar because even when you go abroad, everybody has the same sort of basis that like there is a news in particular and like this, these sort of items tend to be covered in the news. So I think you know, it's really just getting a grounding of how the functionality of it all works, you know. So I, the one thing that I noticed in America, particularly in relation to sport, is they have so much more of it, you know, and they have so much more time. Like we used to have a Friday night show dedicated to high school football. Like, can you imagine a show like that here? Like where yeah. it's like, here's some schools Secondary matches, school, like yeah. here's the Hearty Cup, you know. I mean, people would watch it. But it just, I couldn't believe that there was the interest in a local affiliate in Mississippi for high school football. And it was an hour long show every Friday night. Um, And we had reporters at all the games. And then eventually that's how I got my break doing a bit of that. And like, it was nuts. There was thousands of people at these games. So I think the biggest difference for me was their approach to sport. And like, they didn't care about resources. They were just like, okay, we don't really have a lot of money, but we're going to get a kid to go to this match. Like, you know, like I was an intern, an unpaid intern, and I was going to matches for them. So like, there, I suppose here, we probably don't do that. Like our, our approach is very much, look, and maybe, bec- yeah, and maybe because the national broadcaster has to operate like that, but mm. and local radio probably doesn't have the facilities to do that. But they were so willing to take a chance. They were just like, we really need that game, and if that kid isn't good, sure, what about it? We still have the pictures. We still know who won. We still know the key things. Let's just give someone a chance. And and I loved that. Yeah. I, it's I kind of the American attitude at the end yeah. of the yeah. day. Yeah, and it works for them. I mean, listen probably doesn't work for them all the time Mm. but even if it works 50 percent of the time your outcomes are probably more positive than negative you know and then you jumped into a bit of radio work when you came home you were working out in limerick what was that like i loved it um i actually when i came back from america i went down to live 95 and i handed in my cv and uh, the boss at the time was just like you know i think you're going to be bored doing this because after the year you've had like (laughs) this is actually going to be a step back and I was like, no, 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 I really want to do this. And he, like, I was so kind of enthusiastic that I, I probably was nearly too enthusiastic for him. I'd say he was thinking this one's nuts. But like, I was actually like, I'll do anything, you know. So I was like driving the shadow crew jeeps at the weekend. I was doing like traffic reports. And then myself, Mirren O'Connell, who works in um, Virgin Media now, we used to do a show together then uh, called The Hot Mix. And it was just like this pre-recorded Friday night show. But we'd just get into studio on a Friday afternoon and just act the maggot for an hour, record some links and throw it down. It was just really varied, but I loved it. And actually, 
you, we got so much experience because like that now we were just given a chance yeah. and said let go you know you're young go for it and we made lots of mistakes like I had some crazy times like I was driving the jeeps in the space of one week I accidentally put petrol into a diesel car which like was a very expensive mistake yeah. um, <laughs> nearly wrote off a car yeah. on a Friday uh, the CEO had to come and bail me out which wasn't a, a pleasant phone call to make and then a week later the, the handbrake on the jeep wasn't great and I was parked on Henry Street and anyone knows Henry Street in Limerick there's a big ramp outside it and it like goes right down into town and uh, I jumped out of my Jeep and I was walking back to talk to Mirren to ask her a question. Next thing I saw the Jeep barreling <laughs> down Henry Street. I'm there chasing after it in a pair of flip flops in the middle of the summer. And next thing it smashes into these cars. And I looked down and I was like, oh, it's outside the Garda station. And I was like, OK, sure, that's grand. I'll just go in and I'll tell the guards, listen, I'm really sorry. This, the handbrake is faulty on this yoke. So I went into the Garda station and I was like, look, we're after smashing into these cars here. I just need to identify who owns the cars. And they were like, oh, don't worry. We know who owns those cars. They're unmarked Garda cars. <laughs> So uh, I probably should have lost my job for that as well, but thankfully my CEO was very understanding. So yeah, and the career continued then from from there. When did the national broadcaster? I whenever I was working in Live ninety five, I was actually still in final year in college, and my lecturer at the time had kind of suggested to us we saw an ad on tv looking for contributors for ttv for young people's and uh he had said to me nikki fennel he was just like look i think you guys should apply for this send in some tapes so i sent in a tape and you don't hear anything like so i didn't know that my tape had been looked at in rte and they were actually potentially looking at me for something I just got a random phone call out of the blue from this producer in RTE who still works here called Teresa Smith and she said hi Jackie I got your tape from the talent pool and we'd love you to come and audition to be a um, contributor on TTV and I was like what's a talent pool where did you get my tape and what's TTV like what do you want me to do kind of thing so I came up did an audition and she gave me the gig first of all it was a five minute slot every Monday I used to drive up from Limerick do the five minute slot, get back in the car and drive back down to Limerick and then was in college and was working in Live 95. And then it was only, Teresa said to me, <clears throat> she was like, you should go and meet Ryle Nugent. He's the deputy head of sport in RTE. I think he'd really like you. You should go and have a chat. And I did and just said to him, look, I'd really like to work in production. Like at that point, I didn't really know if I wanted to be presenting or behind the scenes and I kind of had said to him look I'd love to work as a, a sub-editor or a researcher or anything you might have and um, we had a chat and he gave me a job as a sub-editor which I freelanced doing that for a couple of years and it was actually only having conversations like I distinctly remember one that I was having with Ray Houghton I was working as a sub-editor on the premiership when we had the rights to that and back we were in days, back in the good old days, days when we had money and rights and things. And um, I was sitting chatting to Ray and uh, he was saying, we were having a row about something, like a good row, like one of those, ah, he's better and, you know, this lad is playing out of position and whatever. And Ray said to me, look, you're wasting your time having these chats out the back here. Like, why are we arguing, you know, in the production office when you should be having this row on air? Like, this is the kind of stuff that we want to be talking about. And he was just like, you're wasting your time doing this. This is not what you should be doing. And it was kind of after that, I went and started having a few conversations and thought, is this something I can explore? And then thankfully my bosses were receptive, but it was genuinely the support of those kind of people that you wouldn't expect that kind of are the ones who were nudging you in the right way saying like, you should be doing this, which was really good. Really. Yeah, yeah, it was, it really was. Uh, that's actually raises an interesting question because a couple of the guests that we've talked to in RT, they always kind of are able to point to one person that really guided them in the career. For example, like Joe Duffy as well, many people have gave her, of mm -hmm. course. Was there somebody like that for you? Um, God, there was lots of them. Glenn Callan, my former boss, who's now working in the, B the EBU in Geneva, he was really good to me. Like he just, I suppose he kind of recognized the raw talent when I was very young and he wasn't afraid to give me a chance. Like he gave me Sunday sport when I was only 25, you know, and I was obviously the first woman to do it, but it was more like, it wasn't about the woman at that time. It was for me, it was that I was the youngest, you know, and I'd, I went from presenting a four minute bulletin to doing a four hour radio program pretty much overnight. And he took, just took a chance on me. He just was like, look, you're ready for this. You'll grow into it. You're going to make mistakes. But he was very confident that 
I whatever happened, I'd be able to get over it. And so I'm always grateful to him and Paddy Glacken, who was my boss in radio at the time, that both of them took a chance. And then, like, I always go back to Teresa Smith because at the end of the day, I wouldn't be in RTE if she didn't pull my tape out of that TTV slot, give me the five-minute slot in the first place that brought me here because I genuinely think if she didn't, I would have been quite happy working in Live 95 and I would have stayed doing a show there or I would have went back to Cork where I'm from or whatever and I actually would have been quite happy in local radio. I wasn't, I didn't have a bursting ambition to get to RTE necessarily, I just enjoyed the job. So, so I'd, I'll always be grateful to those people for that. Well, Jackie, this past summer, you were given a huge opportunity in being a forefront of the Women's World Cup coverage. How was that? It was, the, was it the first of its kind, really, for RTE to televise all the games? And as a presenter, how did you find that? It was the first in so many ways, because even around the world, last summer felt a bit different mm. when in, with people's approach to women's sport. I think people are actually recognising now that there is a market there for us to start doing them and the audience figures we got were massive so it was a huge opportunity for me as well to do something like that but it was a massive opportunity for RTE and I think our bosses recognise that as well because like we're not in a market anymore where we can just go out and monopolise everything so you kind of need to be creative what, what we do cover because the one thing I know from working in this industry is Irish people love sport and they'll watch anything if you put it on the TV and if you show them that it's good they'll definitely watch it and like the Women's World Cup last year was deadly like the tournament was class America were such good champions the Netherlands were brilliant to watch I know it was disappointment that Ireland weren't there but actually when you have a tournament of that calibre and you're watching it there was one or two games at the start that were you know heavily weighted in one side but after that it got really good so it was a massive opportunity and I loved it and in terms of you know the men's world cup of the year before was there any strategy with this world cup last year to make things different make it feel different not just you know it's it the work of the women's women. version but the, yeah. one of the big things actually that we wanted to do was treat it the same and show people that we were treating it the same so like Kevin Doyle Richie Sadlier worked on the men's world cup and then worked on the women's world cup as well like Louise Quinn and Stephanie Roach worked on both as well and we kind of wanted to show people that our female pundits can talk about the men's game and our men's pundits can talk about the women's game and actually the biggest thing that we can do is just not do anything different like we still pulled out the touch screen we went full hog on it we did all the same graphics packages that we would have done for the men's world cup as well and i think we just kind of if we are going to continue showing more women's sport and you want to continue showing people the caliber that it's at and we're trying to say look there's not a huge difference you kind of need to show people that in your approach there's no point in talking about it and then not doing it like the best thing that we can do is say to richie sadlier analyze this the same way you'd analyze the men's game and then yeah, like in an ideal world it, it wouldn't be a big thing that is the women's exactly. world it's a world cup you don't exactly have to emphasize the yeah practice. exactly and like in a way you know people sometimes people ask me like how do you feel about the use of the word women's like you know why is it the women's world cup why isn't it just the world cup or why isn't it like the men's world cup yeah the world cup? but yeah. like sometimes you just for identification purposes i don't have a problem with the tournament being called the women's six nations because otherwise people are confused they mm -hmm. don't know are you talking about the men's Six Nations? Are you talking about the women's Six Nations? If you mention Adam Griggs and he's a man but he coaches the women, are you confusing him by saying he's the head coach? I don't have a problem with the labels. I actually just think it's when it comes to it, the more familiar we are with names, you know, who does what, then I think we're making progress. But I, I certainly don't have a problem with the idea that, like, they are different genders and they're different games in some ways. I, like, I definitely don't have a problem with that. And the 2020 campaign is something that's come up on this podcast a, a couple of times when talking to um, the likes of Jenny Egan mm -hmm. or Joanne Cantwell. Um, I just want to kind of get a sense of what you think your role is within that campaign as a pretty prominent broadcaster. Well, I think we all have a huge role in it, actually. Um, like, the reality is when I was a kid, it wasn't like this. You know, like, my visible role model was Sonia, and she was still visible in a way that, we saw her on TV, we saw her in newspapers, but not every day. Like, whereas now I think kids are being exposed to so much more. And I think we all have a huge role in that. Like, I take that very seriously. And like, I'm in touch with Sarah Colgan and Sharon who run 20 by 20 all the time because actually they need to be in touch with us as well because like they, they kind of want us to be involved in it too. Like, and I think for young girls, like even, Look, I took a pledge. One of the things that I really wanted to do is I wanted to do something really tangible that young girls 
would be able to see and would know so like I'm in the middle of writing a book at the moment that's going to come out in the summer that's basically like a children's book for young girls right about sports people and it's kind of just like giving them something that I didn't have because how else are we going to change it for them if we don't show them that it's different you know because like they might see Katie Taylor, Kelly Harrington, Stephanie Roach you know around the place they need to understand their stories and realize that they can do that now. Like girls can be professional footballers. They can go down to Australia and play AFL if that's what they want to do. All of the world of opportunity is there for them that wasn't necessarily there when I was a kid. We just need to show them that and make them understand. So I take my role in that really seriously because I think when you do have a voice or whatever you want to call it, it would be a shame not to use it because like there's lots of us out there and I, I kind of think... It's great for little girls to see that if they want to be a sports broadcaster or, you know, an athlete or whatever, that they can. It, the, it's a massive world of opportunity for them Absolutely. now. Like my um, my little cousin Megan, she lives up in Castle Rock, and she's like one of the stars of her her little camogie team at the moment. And yeah. it's fantastic to see that. Like and like my her sister and my goddaughter Alana is less inclined in sports. She's more into the dance, but like it's good to see that they're both so passionate, yeah. and so driven already at a, at a young age. And even now, like even in their schools and stuff. Like they have programs that are pathways for all that stuff now. So whether you want to be a dancer or a singer or into sport, whatever it is, like that's that's what we're talking about. Like it's just giving them an opportunity that, like for lads, that was never a question. It was just there. Like if you talk to young boys and you ask them what do you want to be, they have no problem telling you that I want to be a president or a footballer or whatever. Girls are actually less inclined to say that. Like, there's been studies that say it's between the ages of zero and six that that's where the girls don't have the confidence. Because even at that age, they're not putting up their hand to say, I believe I'm the best here. Whereas, like, young boys, the confidence is there already. So we just need to work with girls to make sure that they understand that all of those things are there for them and that they, your niece can play for Dublin if that's yeah, what she wants to do. Well, fingers you know? crossed. I mean, yeah, fingers crossed. The sponsorship deals from there you go. There you <laughs> go. Um, one thing I want to bring up to you, Jackie, your relationship with Des Cahill, it seems to you, you have just a fantastic working relationship um, yeah. both on and off screen. Is it hard to keep it serious sometimes yeah. on air? Because I know that both of you are complete messers. Oh yeah, we get in trouble all the time. Even <laughs> yeah. last year they were just like, will the pair of ye stop acting the balance? Um, because like sometimes as well when you're in studio, you don't get a lot of rehearsal time and then when we start acting the bollocks they're giving out to us saying you're killing our time can you just do it properly please um but you know what though like it's nice to work with people who you get on with and it's Absolutely. nice to work with people who are of a yeah, similar mindset each other. This yeah podcast is going so terrible badly, yeah. terrible yeah. yeah you're miles away from each other <laughs> but you know though like life is you know like sometimes you kind of need to find the crack in life as well because the job can be very serious at times as well and like having a laugh and a mess like it's not life or death lads it's sport like so you kind of need to be able to show with people like listen we're having the crack here it's a good match we're gonna have the banter about it and like that's hugely important to me as well and honestly like in real life des is even more crack and I'd like to think I am too than even we are on screen because there's only so much you can get away with it as well like if I acted the way in my real life on screen I wouldn't have a job like like my mouth is so loose as well that like I curse way too much um, that's okay we have an explicit yeah one. <laughs> I way. talk too much yeah. um, I wouldn't get away with all that because mm. people would be just like Jesus relax you know whereas like I mean it's crossed our minds and we're not even in a professional setting like we're doing this yeah. podcast off our own backs and like we've done well with it so far but like there's certain things that we'll have to cut out because you just can't put that out into the public yeah sphere. like interviews that have gotten a bit loose so yeah whatever, we have to kind of reel ourselves back yeah in. and like there's a temptation so to keep going <laughs> yeah because see you can keep going and being like okay this a great chat or whatever and then you realize okay it might be offensive maybe i shouldn't say that or you know i guess you just sometimes you have to be careful mm -hmm. and you have to recognize it is a professional capacity that you're there in as well but m most of the time like we we are having the mess in the background as well even with the six o'clock news there's a fair amount of mess and now goes on in the <laughs> background uh before you get to see what you have like for instance you should watch the like particularly the teasers like the amount of effort that goes into writing teasers and stuff like that for before the break coming after coming up mm -hmm. after sport we could have spent 40 minutes 
just dicking around the office coming up with a stupid line that only makes sense to us and we think it's hilarious then it goes on the news and the editors are like that didn't even make sense what were you doing but like we could have just been like oh, go on we'll make like some 1970s disco reference on here just for the crack and we'll be having the absolute roar and laughing back in the office and nobody else gets it but we think it's priceless so yeah. like you know besides Des are there any other notorious messers by RTE? Eamon Horan um, yeah people watch him on the news and they think oh god that little lad from Offaly is, uh, he's good isn't he on the news but like in real life the biggest messer ever um, Hugh Cow, good pal of mine big messer huge messer actually um, you'd be lucky that that lad like doesn't have a podcast to just let things go loose because anything could happen um there's a few of them all right like but it's a pretty good atmosphere like most people up there are up for the crack you know they're 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 into their sport but they get the bigger picture too which is which is important um you've done a lot of work in tv and radio now at this stage of your career which one do you prefer everybody asks me that i i probably say radio because i think it allows people to be more of themselves like sometimes with TV, particularly we'd say to our analysts, like you've got 30 seconds here to make your point. And it's very hard to do that in 30 seconds when you're trying to show a piece of video, you're trying to make your point. You don't want to bury anybody by saying something that you shouldn't say. It's very hard. Whereas on radio, I think when people get the chance to sort of delve into it a little bit more, they can be a bit more open and more it, intimate. Yeah, it's, it's just a lot more intimate. So I probably prefer that side of it, particularly on a Sunday when we get to have the match but also have the chats I like that I do love the TV I think there's a really um, like I suppose there's a craft in being able to do it being able to be on screen and still like listen to somebody you know trying to give you instructions you're trying to get to your breaks you're trying to hit all your your moments so there's a craft in it but if if you put a gun to my head and said you can only do one for the rest of your life it'd probably be radio I'd say Very good. Jackie we'll move on to some general sports discussion um, Cork GAA hurling football Where's it going in the next five years? Jesus, God, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> ask me that. Yeah, well, look, I think there's a lot of progress has been made, which is good news. Um, I mean, I think the hurlers are probably within a puck of a ball of it's winning in all Ireland. Like, you know, the hurling is amazing these years. Like, honestly, whether you love the provincial system or not, it, what it does give us is good games yeah. early in the summer. And, like, okay, it's not perfect, but I think it works. Like, I mean, we haven't had a bad game of hurling in two years, which is... Since the new format came yeah, in, like, it's the, amazing. the standard of championship. Yeah, it's always it's it's really yeah totally. And if you think even in Munster, like, let's say in Waterford, right? Okay, you might say last year didn't go to plan, but, like, all of a sudden, within one blink, you're back in the game. Yeah. Like, you know, like, with Tip, they had a bad year and then come back, bounce back, win in All-Ireland. Like, and you know, even in the Even in the microcosm of a game, a team can go 12 or 13 points yeah. down at half-time and come back in Yeah, yeah, it's totally. Just the nature of it. It's yeah. completely unpredictable. Yeah, like so the Hurland Championship works. Yeah. The football is a problem. I do think, like, in relation to your question about Cork, I think the Cork footballers, first of all, the first thing they've got to do is get out of Division 3. That's going to happen. You can see them already. They're, they're practically out of it already. Um... They, if they could get to an All Ireland semi final, I mean that'd be a massive result for them. Like so, they're and the, the under twenties have had such a good year as well. Um, I think they're definitely on the way back. It'd be great for one of them to win an All Ireland in the next couple of years. I think the hurlers probably sooner than the footballers, but you never know. Were you in attendance for any of the championship wins? Um, for the All Irelands? Yeah. Oh yeah, twenty ten. Geez, twenty ten was an amazing year. My brother won the national bike championship the same day that the Cork footballers won in 2010 so I did the match had the celebration went down to the hotel met the team and then drove to Cork and went to my brother's celebration party so it was like a wild 24 hours I wasn't seen for about three days afterwards yeah 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 yeah, sorry, my dad my dad's from Dublin so I've yeah. been supporting the footballer since I right was okay yeah, but sure yeah, that was the breakthrough came the year after exactly yeah it was, so. it was nearly the catalyst Jeez, we're like. nearly putting you back in the bag <laughs> now <laughs> since then well yeah like. that's the next question Dublin 2020 oh god like I mean I'm living up here now and all I'm listening to like my son joined Kilmico Croaks last September so obviously their club is fairly predominant in all of it as well and all I'm listening to is oh we're buzzing for the half dozen now and all this <sighs> Like the drive for five was hard enough to listen to because oh. it was never done before, but six in a row lads now would be a problem actually yeah, for the GA. Actually, like, our, our most recent interview to go out there was with uh, Owen Sheen from Off the Ball, and we asked him the same question. He thinks that they will do six, but seven will be when they're stopped. Uh, see, the problem is if they do six, then what's to say? Because like this is Desi's first year, so it's a huge challenge for him, yeah. but you get 
he's probably got like a little bit of the overhang for the players from the last time but he is building a new programme if he does six he could easily do seven mm. and then it's a problem I think if Dublin were to continue on this run it is actually genuinely going to become a problem for the GA because the tier two championship we don't know yet how successful it's going to be and if you've got one team dominating one championship and then tier two suddenly seems miles away from that I think that's difficult to be honest I mean I know as a court person you'd hate to say it but for Kerry to win an All-Ireland actually this year would be great for the GAA because it would be the sprinkling of a brand new team it'd be the sparking of an old rivalry between Dublin and Kerry again Tyrone are very close after the lads coming back from Australia and not going and not going away in Colin McShane's case so I think there are teams that could challenge Dublin personally I think it would be a good thing for one of them to win it but you well, know. yeah, well, like we'll have to see. Obviously, you can't really judge anything right now because Dublin in the league and Dublin in the championship are two completely, completely. different team, teams. Yeah. So you have to take. Well, after the league as well, they're not going to have a, a competitive game like properly again until July because mm. they're going to blitz all before them again in Leinster, and then we'll have to wait for the Super Eights and then see what it throws up. And it really depends then on who they get in their group as to what happens. So it's very hard to see what they're like, you know. Very true. But just one real thing to say, yeah. I'd say we'll just go a couple of more. Uh, we'll just wrap up in a sip. Yeah, no minutes. panic, yeah. no panic. Um, yes, yeah, so, Jackie, I'm, I don't know if you're at liberty to say as a sports broadcaster, but is there any sports you just don't like covering? There's none that I don't like covering, but there are some that are more challenging than others. Right. Like, when it comes to racing, for instance, like, that's an industry rather than just a sports interest. And if you're not in Tipperary on a Tuesday, it's very hard to know the form and see... Like where horses are being run, are they put there on purpose? Is somebody just trying to see them? Like so, it, that is always a one sport that I always have to ask an opinion on because I wouldn't have the background knowledge to know everything there is to know about it. Like Hugh Cal's good pal of mine, and he does a lot of the racing, so I'd often ring him and be like, "What's the story here?" Or Ruby Walsh, and just ask them because sometimes as well, I think in this, the biggest thing that you can do is actually ask for advice. Sometimes, like in this industry, there can be a tendency for everyone to think that you know everything there is to know about sport and probably early on in my career I would have just never asked any questions and just tried to get by like that whereas now I'm actually l much more inclined to pick up the phone and ring somebody who is an expert in that field and say like if it comes to snooker let's say ring somebody and say listen what's the story with your man does he have any chance here or whatever because you can't be an expert in everything like you yeah, know and any niche sports, you know, sports that people don't usually follow that you're actually really into? Uh, well, see, I basketball is a bloody niche sport these days, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. even in Ireland, I'm there like, oh, this, this is class. And they're just like, who is he? And I'm like, this guy's going to be in the NBA. And they, <laughs> so that's probably a niche sport. Um, anything else that I'm into? Not re I do like watching ice hockey when I see it pop up on the TV. It'll never be big here. It'll never Bro. catch on. But it is deadly to watch, you know. Oh, yeah, I've caught a couple of games class it's it, it, yeah well it's something anyways yeah it's like I mean, we like our violent sports here now in ireland and that's like taking it to another yeah. level nearly sometimes yeah um your favorite moments in sport at a personal level now because yeah. i know that you've played a lot of it mm -hmm. and then as a fan or covering sport um uh, covering katie taylor's gold medal win in 2012 was off the charts like mm -hmm. it is proper even when I think about it it's actually spine tingling moment oh, yeah. we were we were driving home from Kerry that day and dad was like okay fine I'll listen to it on the radio but as the radio coverage got like more hyped more hyped he pulled in we walked into the pub just to watch the oh, end of it and then got back into the car it, it was right. amazing because it was just like I was surrounded by people like Des was on one side of me Marty and Jimmy McGee and like everyone <laughs> is just so, and there I am like we're all in tears I was like if anybody could see us like I'm here with all these lads bawling crying like if the nation could see them but it was just so amazing because like I suppose we've all kind of gotten to know Katie and like you know she's kind of like the nation's treasure and when yeah. you see somebody who you've literally grown up watching like you know she was a child when she first came to prominence like you're watching her fulfilling a lifelong dream and the whole country is there behind her it was amazing like it'll for as long as i live it'll stay with me as the greatest day to be a sports fan and then to be a journalist on top of it to be there covering it was amazing um and then in a personal capacity i was in twickenham when ireland won the grand slam in 2018 it was the coldest day i have ever <laughs> put down i was actually i probably shouldn't say this but like i was there like as a fan so i was there in a drinking capacity as i would call it i had eight cans during the game because it was so cold we just had to keep going out to the bar like and then it was just like 
reckless because you know you're just like it was like minus seven degrees i had to go into the club shop and buy gloves and the only gloves they had were like england rugby gloves <laughs> and i was like ah oh, fuck it i'm getting them anyway i don't care because my our hands were so cold yeah. but it was one of those amazing days it was great like ireland didn't put a foot wrong no, that sorry, day so it was, yeah it was perfect it was amazing brilliant um uh, i think we're gonna wrap it up there. yeah uh, i think one more question and um, we usually ask our guests involved in the industry just any advice Keep at it is actually the biggest thing. Um, you know, like the nose can be hard to take sometimes. And when you think the road is kind of closing in on you and you're not going to get the breakthrough, there's always a way. You just have to find it. You know, um, like I took unpaid internships. I drove up and down to Dublin for five minute gigs. I went to matches when I wasn't being paid. I used to write reports and just send them in knowing that there was a good chance they weren't going to be used. But it was just... The, being disciplined and making myself do it even when I thought there wasn't a job at the end of it because it's really easy to get disheartened like because it's you know it can be really hard when you're trying to get in but actually the more persistent you are the better chance you have of making it happen brilliant awesome. Jackie thanks a million for coming no problem at all delighted to do it's it been in conversation with Jackie Hurley thanks a million for listening and we'll see you next time thank you